Shalom, fellow Rebbeim. I hereby call this emergency meeting to discuss a halachic solution to Miss Rubenstein's predicament. Are we familiar with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about her gefilte face from last Shabbos. No, let's recap. Our bait has been approached by Mr. Shalom, who is in the process of suing Miss Rubenstein for full damages after having been in a car crash with her. Don't forget to mention that Miss Rubenstein was driving an Oliva, one of those new self-driving cars. The car automatically swerved into Mr. Shalom when a pedestrian got in her way. Exactly, rabbits and grits. But Miss Rubenstein insists that her car programming company is at fault. So, who is liable to pay for Mr. Shalom's damages? Oh, well, we should reach out to Oliva Industries. I have the CEO, Mr. Levine, on my speed dial. Perfect. Let's give him a call. Hello, Mr. Levine. How are you? Yes, I'm calling on behalf of the bait scene and Miss Rubenstein's incident. Well, yes, I understand that. Uh-huh. Okay, thanks. Well, that sounded promising. Mr. Levine wasn't too happy about us calling, especially knowing the amount Mr. Shalom was asking for. Okay, so let's just take it from the beginning then. What type of damage is the car? Oh, that's easy peasy. It falls under the category of mafia, man. Miss Rubenstein was driving a car, and she caused the damage. But the car was self-driving, so she didn't make the decision to swerve out of her lane. Okay, so maybe it falls under the category of ox? It was moving and causing damages. Yes, but the car isn't alive. It can't move around freely. It acts in response to its surroundings based on its programming. Well, while we're at it, let's at least concur that it can't be a pit. We just said it was moving, and I'm pretty sure pits don't move. So what does that leave us then? Fire. No, it can't be fire. Come on, Rabbi Englander, let's stay serious. No, I am serious. The car fits the category perfectly. It was moving as it caused damage, and according to Ralph Papa, it had two forces at play. Okay, continue. We can all agree that the car was acting in response to other drivers on the road. This allows us to compare it to a stone left where the wind can carry it. Of course, in Bava Kama 3B, Ralph Papa teaches us that a rock blown off the roof by a gust of wind into someone is defined as fire. With this in mind, the bait team could see the two forces in play for the category of fire. Primary, lighting the fire, and auxiliary factors, the forces after the fire has been lit. Exactly. We see the primary factor in our case when Miss Rubenstein turns on the car and the auxiliary factor when the jaywalker crosses, acting as the gust of wind. Now we can decide who is liable. But since we just concluded it's fire, my vote is on Miss Rubenstein. She lit the fire, therefore she is responsible for it. I don't know if it's that simple. This is a case of grama, meaning that Miss Rubenstein is one step removed. She didn't provoke the damaging, but rather her car did because of its programming. No, so where does that leave us? In Bava Kama 26b, Rashi tells a story of a person who throws a utensil off of a roof to land on the pillows below. The, room remo the remover of the pillows is exempt, teaching that cases of grama are poter. Oy vey! Miss Rubenstein is exempt then! Bava Kama 68 states that if the wind fanned the fire, all are exempt. Exactly the current conundrum we are deliberating. Continuing, we can also define this as a case of onus or duress. People would otherwise be liable in adulterous situations, but we see in Bava Kama 28b that if a girl is raped, she is not held liable because it was out of her control. So we can conclude that duress is exempt from liability as well. Oh, but wait. Petsa tachet petsa, a wound for a wound, in Bava Kama 26b, explains that when someone damages another, whether intentionally or under duress, they are still liable. I'm confused. Rabbi Englander said duress is exempt, while Rav Avram said duress is liable. How can we define duress? It seems like the Tosafot of Baba Kama 27b is explaining what duress is using levels of responsibility given to a borrower, unpaid watchman, paid watchman, and renter. Here, the Tosafot explicitly differentiates between how duress can be classified in two ways, a case of thievery and a case of negligence. Yeah, thievery shows an example of duress that is completely out of someone's control while lost objects lean towards a form of duress that shows negligence from the watchman. This differentiates how liable someone is for onus. Oh, so therefore anything classified as a case of thievery is exempt because of extreme duress or onus gamor. What a fine line between what theft and negligence really is considered. So, how would we categorize our situation? Was it completely out of Ms. Rubenstein's control, or was she being negligent? <clears throat> she wasn't being negligent at all. She couldn't do anything in the situation, similar to a case of thievery. That's a good point. And because the car's programming was in control, the car was sim simply reacting to its surroundings, like a pedestrian. And even more so, since the pedestrian was an illegal pedestrian. Going back to Rav Papa, 
This jaywalker would be considered an unusually strong, uncommon gust of wind, strengthening this as a case of extreme duress or owner's gamor. There was no level of negligence on Miss Rubenstein's part. The pedestrian caused her to damage. Perfect. Raji explains in Baba Kama 3B that an uncommon wind is exempt because of extreme duress. All signs point that Miss Rubenstein is exempt. Well, don't forget Tom Moody and Rochelle Roven damaged an object because Shimon put something next to him while he was sleeping. Roven would be exempt because it was an extreme case of duress, similar to thievery. Okay, so Miss Rubenstein is not liable to pay for the damages. That leaves the pedestrian and Mr. Levine. Well, Mr. Levine is pretty upset at me at the moment. Just call to apologize tomorrow. Mr. Levine is exempt as well because there was no malfunction or defect. The Oliva did the right thing by not killing the pedestrian because its programming is designed to minimize the risk of fatalities. Exactly. The car is not liable because it saved a life. Pikuach nefesh. Okay. So now that leaves the pedestrian. Any word from him? No, trust me. I would have called him already. Either way, the pedestrian only caused the Oliva to swerve, not him, Mr. Shalom. Grama applies here as well, exempting him from liability. So, halakhically, no one is responsible for Mr. Shalom's damages. All right, congrats, Pavarum. We solved the case. Not so fast. The legal system, unfortunately, does not hold to the laws of Grama and Onis Gamor. It follows the rules of the road. Rules of the road? Meaning that everyone is driving with the assumption that every car has insurance. Insurance companies know that accidents happen and are therefore prepared to cover the damages. In this case, New York's no-fault insurance policy will cover each party's damages. But, okay, should the car have even been driven in the first place? Hmm, Ms. Rubenstein did say that if she could have stopped the car, she would have, but there was no option to. To answer this, let us delve into what Rabbeinu Asher explained explicitly that a person on foot is only permitted to run if he could come to a complete stop if necessary. Therefore, we can conclude that people should only use something that could be controlled, in this case, a car that could stop. Yeah, and the Oliva is able to stop in normal circumstances. It is self-programmed to follow the legal speed limits in place and has a brake system for when it senses a stop is approaching. So legally, the car can be driven because of the already present brake system. Okay, but there really should be a human override option. A computer cannot make decisions based on morals. It can only act in direct response to what is immediately in front of it. Although the program is designed to limit damage, it cannot see the whole picture and understand the circumstances at play. Amen. We as a Beijing will advise Mr. Levine to change the programming and add a human override system. Beautiful. I think that about covers it all. Thank you all for ruling on this case. Bechat I, I, I like to, uh, your presentation. The one area where I'm still, I'd like you to kind of explain to me a bit more, is your your last point about the the human override. Especially, I'm, you know, biased by the presentation, sort of like the scientific fact of that humans aren't necessarily more effectual. That in the case we learned that. There was no, it was assumed that you couldn't stop short and actually save in this situation. So I'm not quite sure of how the override would actually help solve the, the problem. So if you could clarify for me a bit more about your, the insistence of having a human override. Um, so we're saying in this case, maybe not so much an override would have helped it because um, she wouldn't have had time to stop it. But in other cases where there's moral or ethical decisions, a computer can't see the whole picture. It can only act in response to directly what's in front of it, and it can't, it can't tell what the pros and cons of each situation at play are. So we, w we would want to put an override to the brake system, allowing um, the car to be able to be stopped in cases where someone could be able to stop it, and a steering wheel so that the person can choose, maybe on an ethical level, of how they want to conduct, go through the situation. In this case, we're in agreement with what the car did. We just want that for the future in case of another situation where they could have that option to stop if needed. Is there an ethical system that a human can perform that's above pikuach nefesh? Um, we were thinking of it in a sense of, um, I know this is an awful example, but if, let's say, you were crossing the road and the car is about to hit um, either an old person or a baby, like, which which one would you hit? And of course, this is an awful decision that that someone would have to make 
And of course, we can't value one life over the other, but we're saying in situations where ethical, ethical morals come into it, there should be an override system because computers don't know what's happening. The good old trolley problem. <laughs> um, can you guys go into a little bit more detail for me about, um, and you, you, you did a good job, it just went a little bit quickly, so help me out a little bit, about the difference between negligence and thievery and why Ms. Rubenstein qualifies for this duress, because duress with, you know, the word duress is a very, like, evocative term. So tell me about duress with thievery and duress with negligence and how that word duress applies. Um, so we're saying that um, we find contradicting sources in the Gemara that says that duress is liable and then we find that duress is exempt. And um, if we, if you look in Bava Kama 27b, the Tosafot explains it, um, and he, there, in the sources, they classify between um, when someone is liable for duress, um, it would be in a form of negligence, as in someone lost an object and um, they misplaced it. That would show a level of, of negligence, meaning the person could have maybe paid a little more attention, maybe could have watched the object a little more. Um, yes, they lost it. There's nothing that could have been done, but it, there, there's a little bit of fault that could have fallen on it. Rather, um, we see people are exempt in cases of thievery where it's completely out of their control as in someone literally takes something from them and it's not them acting it's the other person and you can't control other people so um, we applied this to our case saying that um, Miss Rubenstein was in a car that she had no control of and a jaywalker who wasn't supposed to be where where he was it was he was jaywalking crossed the road and Literally, she had no control over the situation. It wasn't as if she was being negligent. It wasn't as if she could have done something to prevent it. It was completely out of her control because of, of the wind, the jaywalker. Okay, so let me ask the same question that we posed to the other group to just help us understand a little bit more why, and you address the insurance, so thank you. Again, why would the insurance, if that's the purpose of insurance, why would the insurance be exempt as well? They didn't. They oh, said, sorry. They said, oh, they, they, they were paying. They're sorry, saying, sorry. They're saying they're saying that, the that his, sorry, sorry, his, sorry, sorry. That his yeah. insurance. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but I think, but I would put it as why would her, like, I think, oh, you're saying because it's no fault. Never mind. Yeah, I answered it. Okay. So. Um. Major. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.